I'm going to say thank you for that warm Phoenix rising welcome. <laughs> so um, today I want to give you a little background on where I've come uh, from these ideas. Also introduce you to two studies that have already been conducted and time permitting, tell you where we're going next. All right. Um, also give you um, summaries and conclusions, a couple of little takeaways from the beginning steps of this research, because this is ongoing um, processes. And then, of course, in the end, we can all chat and maybe help each other out, think about some things that I need to do moving forward as well. So as you read in the bio, the main premise of my research always comes back to this idea of success and satisfaction. I literally <laughs> just gave part of this lecture this morning in the general psych class. Right? So I'm teaching uh, two sections of general psychology. The exam scores were just kind of meh. Some of the students are like, I'm good. And the rest of them are like, I'm about to die. <laughs> right? And one of the things I've noticed is, in the literature, we often talk about this idea of success. We look at GPAs. We talk a lot about retention. But we rarely ask the questions, how do these students feel? So how can I look at some of these students with a C, and they're happy, completely content. Other students, you know, the world is coming to an end because they just made this C. And I realized we're missing this component, this kind of sense of personal success, right? So what another student perceives as success is not the same thing that another student perceives as success. But oftentimes in the literature, we don't look at the difference between the two. Retention, 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 but we kind of miss, well, what is retaining them? Because it's not just the fact that I need this degree for my next step or, you know, graduate school career or what say you. Why are you here? And I think that's a question that we don't always get to ask or, or truly understand. I also want to make the distinction and importance on campus climate. Because oftentimes people see these topics and they're thinking, oh, this is going to be a HBCU PWI comparison study. And actually, it's not. I'm sorry if that's what you came for, right? What it is is a campus climate um, study. Because the reality is there's no perfect campus, all right? And I chose these setups for a reason. So this is a lot of the um, HBCUs. There's actually um, over 100, so this isn't all of them. Shout out my alma mater, though. We're on there. <laughs> But then if you look over here, right, this is actually two um, different images pieced together. We have our Ivies, right, and we also have the Big Ten. I like to make this distinction because oftentimes when we talk about HBCUs, people throw all the HBCUs together. Well, let's just see what happened at the HBCU. But when we talk about PWIs, we don't do that. You know, do you think Princeton is comparing itself to UNCG? Right? But quickly, somebody will want to make the comparison with the HBCUs, and especially since these HBCUs can be public, they can be private, they can be large, small, southern, northern, right? All of this makes a difference. So when you kind of move forward with this research, think about it in those regards, too. So I may be simplifying terms and saying HBCU and PWI, but we should all realize it's not that simple, right? The same way that no HBCU is going to be the same, no PWI is going to be the same either which comes back to the idea of campus climate. It's really about what's going to be the right fit for that particular student. There's no such thing as the perfect campus climate. So with the work I want to talk to you about today, as you just heard some from my bio, I want to talk about these social and academic factors that are coming into um, play, right? What's moving beyond this idea of a GPA and graduation? What's happening along those four years, some, sometimes five, sometimes six? right, that's going into play that's allowing these students to be successful. And when I use success, I'm thinking about graduation, but also self-worth. Because we know there's a lot of other things that are going on here, right? What is coming into play that's causing maybe some delays, right, or, or lack of motivation that we always don't know where it's coming from. So the first study that I want to talk about deals with this concept of the universal context of racism. So the theory of universal context of racism is kind of think about looking at the world through this cultural lens, right? So if you're a member of a historically targeted group, right, this is a solely race-based theory, you realize that at any given point in time, you could be um, stereotyped, judged, had a, another preconceived notion placed upon you just because of your historical uh, setting, right? Because people assume this about that particular group of people. Now, this isn't to say that everybody who falls within this category of living within the UCR is highly sensitized. That's not what the UCR is saying. It's more of a monitoring system. 
So not only is it a theory, but it's also a measurement. So our measurement can actually break down into these three categories. So as you can see, you can actually have a UCR score where you're not even thinking about race. But oftentimes we see more people falling into like a mix of these categories as to how this monitoring system was action. So a person who's high UCR isn't necessarily walking around saying everybody in the world is against me. But this person who's high UCR is saying, you know, there is a possibility that this situation may be because of my race and not because of my personality or other internal traits or attributes about me. With that being said, a lot of my work also stems around racial identity. So what do I mean by this? That's significance or importance that people put on their race. Because if I'm constantly in an environment where I may be um, stigmatized because of my race, how is my feelings or beliefs about my race being interpreted? There's tons of research that shows that this could actually help these behavior situations. In my work, I like to use the multidimensional model of racial identity. So this is Rob Sellers and a, a, the whole crew originally out of University of Michigan. I'm a MIBI person, right? So they measure these ideas based on salient centrality, the regards, and ideology. What we're going to be talking about today is focusing on centrality, that significance, how important is race to you, because that in itself is going to have different meaning to different people. And all of a sudden, also thinking about how other people view your race as well, right, with the publics and the privates. So for the first study, I really wanted to start partialing out some of these ideas of campus climate and what do these things really mean. We make assumptions about what these environments are, but they're not always that case and true. So we have two HBCUs in this uh, sample and one PWI. Um, the PWI is from the north, uh, one HBCU in the north and one in the south. Um, as you can see, majority females coming into this sample. And I assessed across two time points their level of black identity using the MIBI. Discrimination frequencies. Um, this was important because oftentimes people assume <laughs> that these students on a historically black uh, campus aren't experiencing discrimination. Right? That's a whole nother study for <laughs> a different month, but I can also talk about how oftentimes if you're discriminated by your in group, it actually has a greater impact than when you discriminate it by your out group. Or simply put, I can deal with the clans member because I know he doesn't like me. But when my skin folk don't like me, that's a whole nother issue, right? That's a study for another day. <laughs> but this is where the premise of this idea is coming from because those hassles are still real. Not to mention, they got to leave campus, right? So when they go to tar um, Target, who knows what could happen? And nowadays, thanks to social media, you don't even really have to leave the classroom. Right? So you can be targeted by discrimination of just opening up Facebook and seeing what video pops up that you didn't really need to see that day. Also, looking at self-esteem. So historically, Rosenberg self-esteem scale is just a favorite amongst us in psychology. It's quick, it's dirty. You know, you can easily put it out there, but it has strong reliability, as you'll see in a moment. So looking at some basic cor um, correlations as to how these ideas work out, no initial surprises just yet. This universal context of racism, of course, we're seeing a significant correlation with discrimination frequency. So those people who are highly UCR, they're monitoring the situation, they're noticing more aspects of discrimination that's taking place. Um, also not surprised with the UCR being positively uh, correlated with racial identity. So these people are understanding that I'm in this world, but, and I can't speculate from these correlations, but it's also showing that maybe racial identity is having some type of buffer effect, right? So that's why these people who are high racial identity, high UCR, they're not necessarily low self-esteem. Because you see self-esteem was only positively um, correlated with racial identity, but still in a positive direction. High racial identity, I'm high in self-esteem. So it could be coping, I can't say that from this. So this is different from what you would normally see. Instead of noticing what's bold, what's in bold, not statistically different, right? Everything else is pretty interesting and fascinating. So let me start with this whole GPA. So there's a, a finding in the literature that shows that students tend to self-report higher GPAs than they have, but at HBCUs, they self-report even higher GPAs than they think they have, right? And I know it's an interesting finding. It could speak to maybe that sense of belonging, or I know at Bennett College, we refer to campus as the oasis, right? This is the oasis. So to remind our students every day that this place is not real, right? You're not necessarily going to ever be in an environment of this many women of color in one space at any given time. So that could, you know, speak to how 
you know, they, it started out high, but then, you know, a little bit of a reality check <laughs> by time too, but still pretty high. Also looking at these levels of self-esteem, notice the students at HBCU had higher levels of self-esteem at time one and time two. And this is in comparison to just the PWI time one, HBCU time one, right? And then discrimination frequency also gets interesting too. At time one, right, not really a surprise here that the PWI, and these are all, you know, black students, are reporting more issues of discrimination frequency. However, by time two, there's not a difference in report across campus. That's what I was alluding to earlier, where people tend to make the assumption, right, that these issues aren't taking places on other campuses, but they are, and our students leave. They have to leave campus and still experience what's going on in the rest of the world. Another interesting finding is looking at racial identity. So racial identity is measured on a scale of one to seven. So these are pretty high across the board. But interesting to note that it's still higher at the HBCU. But we can't speculate too much on this because we don't want to start to make the assumption that, oh, students with high levels of racial identity choose HBCUs. That's not true, right? So there are definitely students at HBCUs <coughs> that have no regard to their level of racial identity. Right? I've engaged with some of these students. So you might be like, well, why are they at HBCU? Maybe they offered them the most money. Maybe it's tradition. Other people in their family went. Maybe it's locality, right? I'm thinking about, um, you know, just driving up here from Greensboro, we're across the street from North Carolina A&T, the largest HBCU in the nation. But people don't necessarily go to A&T because they're HBCU. They're also top in the South for engineering, right? So if you live in North Carolina and you want to go to engineering school, you're probably going to go to A&T or NC State, right? So it doesn't really matter, right, this whole makeup of the school. Am I just going to go to that engineering program or the other engineering program? So just some things to think about. So just to review, what we just saw in the two previous slides. Students who live within the UCR are more sensitized to their race, right? We figured that was gonna be the case coming into it, right? Because if you're living in this system where you're constantly being monitored, right? Be it real or perceived, that's another thing with the UCR, just be it real or perceived, you gotta take this in consideration with your race. Now the level of racial identity did vary across the institution. It was statistically significant. However, it was still pretty high. Right, so we were kind of going into this thinking that we would see these kind of lower levels, at least four or less coming out of the PWI, but that wasn't necessarily the case, right? Also, that we did see some institutional um, influence on self-esteem, right? Remember I told you that the levels of self-esteem were lower, or you saw, were lower at the historically, um, I said historically black college, at the predominantly white institution than at the historically black college, and at the historically black college it even increased. But that could also be a part of the culture. More nuances is that we still have to parse out with the study moving forward. But this, I feel like, was one of the more interesting points to be made about this study, and is that difference in discrimination frequency. Because oftentimes, people are thinking the safest environment, this isn't happening on these campuses, and actually it is, right? And sometimes at a greater amount than people report because students might say, well, I just kind of expect that to happen. Unless, like I said, it's coming from an in-group member, then we have these other issues that we have to talk about. And we replicated that same finding in the literature with the students self-reporting higher uh, GPAs. So this is actually uh, in a paper that's currently under review right now. So it should be coming out in uh, group processes, and intergroup relations, I think in March is when the uh, special issues drops. Just looking at these uh, intergroup differences across various environments. So that whole racial discrimination finding, it was really kind of bothering us, right? Like, where, where are we going where it's a universal issue? So we can't just say one campus is going to cause more issues of racial discrimination than another campus. So moving forward, we wanted to partial out more uh, with the well-being side of my success and satisfaction. And this actually stemmed from a student that I met uh, when I was in graduate school when I first kind of started processing this idea of success and satisfaction. She had a 3.8 GPA, star softball player, and she showed up in my office one day, um, which also just speaks to the, uh, the culture at this institution. So the University of Delaware at the time when I was a graduate student was only 5%, um, actually was 5% minority. So that also included international students as well. So basically word got out that there's a black female grad student and students would randomly show up at my office all the time. So that, I mean, that, that might seem odd, but it, it, was, it was just kind of the norm, where there were days where I could just be working at the, the local coffee shop, Brujahas, and students would walk over to my table and just start talking to me. 
right? Just because I'm another face and you know, all the undergrads knew each other. But anyway, she was miserable. And I'm like, how are you miserable? Like, I immediately know who you are because I saw your picture on a poster, right? And she was like, you know, I barely sleep. I'm so stressed out. You know, I got to make sure I'm amazing and everything. And I was like, oh, wow. So that's what kind of got me playing with this idea of success and satisfaction. It's not the same thing. So here's this young lady who was highly successful, but she was not satisfied, right? Go back to the literature. We see these things time and time again. If we, if we look at the age group of people who are more likely to experience racial discrimination or you know, th this kind of spotlight the traditional lady was also telling me about, that's putting us in that um, late adolescent college age student that will fall into that category, right? And for her, um, she got into a point of deciding in order to avoid racial discrimination, I'll just be perfect. So everybody liked her. She knew how to fit in with all groups, but it was also exhausting her at the same time. And tons of research out there that shows how this can impact psychological well-being. So moving forward, with study two, at Bennett College, I decided, well, let me spend some time focusing on the well-being assessment. And this was uh, very interesting for us because we went to a, a depression conference. That in itself should shock some of you guys. <laughs> I did not know this existed. So apparently the University of Michigan has a, it's the DOCC, Depression on College Campuses Conference, that they hold every year. And it is literally people from all over talking about ways to decrease this rise of depression that we're seeing across college campuses. So I'm thinking, oh my goodness, so this isn't something that I'm just seeing at you know, the campuses that I'm engaging with in the South. This is a nationwide issue that's going on. Um, to the point where I went to a session where Notre Dame has actually purchased furniture that's, that is, um, how did she describe it? It's outside of fact that's aeronomical, everything is movable because they're trying to decrease the amount of stress in study environments. And I was like, uh, that's a whole nother level. Blew my mind. <laughs> uh, it was fascinating, but I was like, oh, okay. And they even had a, a full blown conversation about color. So even the color of the furniture to make sure you're coming into an environment that's not gonna be too overly stimulating, but also not too drab. And I was like, wow, finding this happy medium. So I was thinking, okay, well that made me feel a little bit better because we're on to something where we're going with the work because I will Go ahead and warn you, it, it does get depressing, right? So um, as Buffy alluded to earlier, my other, uh, myself and my other colleague, we integrated yoga into the PE curriculum at Bennett College. So yes, I know yoga is not a PE, but in order to get through SACS and you know, get it out there to the students, we were able to offer this one credit um, course because we did need some other options. My colleague teaches the course. She's also a certified yoga instructor as well. And at first we were thinking, oh, nobody's gonna sign up, especially since my colleague decided to offer yoga at 8 a.m., right, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, where sometimes I wasn't even showing up to assist, <laughs> depending on you know, what type of uh, asana she was going through that day. But um, she actually maxed out. So it was two sections of 35 students each. She had 70 students the first semester, right? I believe this is the first semester that we have not maxed out the 35, but that's probably because Bennett is right under 500 students. So at this point, I think probably 75% of the campus has <laughs> participated in the yoga class. Hence, they're, you know, one of the results that I had to make sure um, I typed up to, to share because I, you know, I don't want it skewing other people's results, but you know, that tends to happen. And also, we're pretty well-known professors on campus. Between me um, teaching a general education course like psychology, my colleague, Professor Jeffries, is journalism and media studies, so I don't know how that goes on this campus, but everybody loves JMS. Right? You know, they're interviewing everybody with cameras, and so, so everybody loves Professor Jeffries. Right? <laughs> But um, along the way in her class, I said, well, hey, you know, this is working out so well. Why don't we actually turn this into a research project? So initially, this was just let's just help our bales because our bales need this. This helped us. We're going to share it with them. Now let's turn this into a project. So we got, you know, just over half of the students to um, participate in a study. Again, I looked at um, level of black identity added in risk of depression this time, because we're hearing all of this stuff, we think our students are there, but again, you know, it's empirical science. We need to test this and, and see what's going on. But instead of using the racial discrimination hassles, this time I went for ostracism scale. 
because when it comes to this idea of depression, these young ladies could be dealing with other types of anxieties outside of racial depression. So the ostracism scale could be touching on some of these in-group, out-group differences, but you know, it also could touch on these other things that are coming into play as well. So again, very high centrality. So uh, being black, very important to these students. Um, privately, they also felt pretty good about it as well. Um, public regard, this is normal. So notice what public regard is about how they feel that other people are viewing black people. Hence the reason why this number tends to go down, right? This also isn't um, a shock that this is taking place. So, you know, this is not old data. So this is Trump era data, right? Where we actually have, you know, the FBI saying we got increases, right, of um, hate crimes that are taking place right now. So it's not really mind boggling to see that they're like, you know what, other people aren't feeling as strongly about my racial group as I do, right? We, we constantly hear about this uh, time and time again, all right, especially in regards to black and brown people. But this is where I said it gets a little sad and gets a little scary, right? So using the CESD, again, very commonly used measure in our field, the risk, anything greater than 20, we came in at 40. Right, so talk about at a risk, a lot of our students were talking about anxiety and depression or feeling overwhelmed that you know was taking place, which made me also realize the University of Michigan is on to something with this conference, right? This definitely is a nationwide problem because you would think on a campus our small where I can pretty much name all my advisees and tell you their hopes and dreams. Who wants to be a speech pathologist? Who wants to be marriage and family <laughs> counselor? But yet we, we still have these issues where they all, all have, not all, but a good amount of anxieties that are taking place that we just were not aware of. So shocking and sad, but also making us see the importance of needing to carry forth the yoga because what we found is some of the students were saying the yoga was helping. Now with the ostracism scale, we're still, we're more middle of the road, so not beyond um, the average of how other people are reporting out on this scale. And like I said, this is kind of open-ended, but I did that on purpose. These, um, the ostracism scale isn't race-based, but still interesting to note, because again, it's a college campus, right? Um, I've also found um, another topic we're starting to look into in regards to ostracism. Apparently, Snapchat can make the students feel very ostracized. So I'm a little limited in my Snapchat knowledge. <laughs> So one of my students was trying to explain it um, to me one day and was showing me her Snapchat where you can ghost your, per, your avatar so people can't necessarily see where you are. And she said that some of her friends, not she didn't use the word ostracized, but they all were at a party and they ghosted their avatars so she didn't know that they all went to the party together. So imagine her surprise when she gets a video alert and she sees all of her friends Snapchatting at the party and she was like, but they're not even together, oh snap. I was like, wow. So a whole nother level of ostracism that we're going to have to consider moving forward as to how social media could be impacting these things. So we're thinking, you know, day-to-day -day life on a college campus and being a college student, again, you don't have to leave your room to be ostracized now, right? Uh, a, a, another a level of that to think about. So other things that came out of this study that were important that we were needing to talk about, especially in regards to yoga, Bennett College is a United Methodist affiliated school. So notice I said affiliated. We're not forcing students to pray. Um, you don't have to be Christian to attend, but we did find out that the majority of our sample was self-identified. This was huge in the yoga class and made us realize we were gonna have to make some changes with our yoga moving forward. Um, I'll talk more about that in a moment, right? Our males who were reporting ostracism were at a greater risk for depression. So I'm not trying to downplay the ostracism, but I think we have to think of other levels of ostracism that are coming into play since it wasn't like blown out the water ostracism, but still pretty important to consider moving forward as well. Also, the importance of racial identity. So we've seen this in the literature and we definitely saw it play out in our study as well your black identity matters, right? Those people who were strong in the significance and importance of their black identity are um, better able to deal with these different issues like ostracism that were taking place on our campus. So moving forward, I wanna bring in another theoretical framework to think about with this. And this also ties in with the idea of depression 
and anxiety that some of our students are seeing. So Dr. Carter has this concept of race-based traumatic stress injury. Almost thinking of racism as a mild PTSD form. Because if I'm constantly in this universal context of racism, and I know that any time I could experience these levels of discrimination because of my historical uh, targeted nature, not because of anything that I could potentially be doing or saying, but just because of how somebody else is perceiving me. Um, I'm thinking right now, um, jokingly but sad, Niecy Nash, a, a pretty well-known comedian, recently came out with this spoof on 1-800-WHITE-FEAR. Right, and she spelled it W-Y-T-E. <laughs> you know, you head like, you know where this is going. So she was like, you know, stop calling 911. Instead, call this number, and I will help you determine whether or not you need to call 911. So you know, now we have this whole hashtag of people just trying to be black and live, right? I'm doing things like babysitting two kids that happen not to have the same level of melanin that I have, and now I got a lady telling me and calling the cops or even here in North Carolina. Two ladies, two um, black females, car breaks down, lady in the apartment complex is calling the cops because she was like, there's no way your car broke down in this area. Again, they really did just break down and they were waiting on AAA to come. But think about how we're constantly in these environments where oftentimes people of color are subjected to different levels of hostility that nobody's asking for. I'm just trying to live my life, right? How would that repeated impact be? And also think about that social media caveat I just said, or I can remember having um, th these conversations with my students. On Facebook, there was um, a guy who was randomly shooting people, but they were, people were posting the live images of the people getting shot. Or I'm thinking about the um, uh, Fidel, uh, uh, thank you, Castro right, where you remember his death was literally on live because his girlfriend wanted the people to see how he was getting harassed and he had a gun that he was licensed to have, right? So if any day I already know that I'm being monitored, right, and then I'm trying to monitor the fact that I'm being monitored, it could probably lead to this injury that's taking place. So moving forward, we're thinking maybe if we integrate more of yoga and also mindfulness, hence the contemplative practices that I was talking about, could we use this to also impact some other negative conditions? So not just the anxiety, but what could go even further, right? Our students who are dealing with other health issues like hypertension, um, we do have weight issues that are, are taking place on our campus as well. And a lot of it is stress, where you know my students are telling me, well, you know, after taking general psychology, I realized I stress eat. Absolutely, most of us do, right? When you're trying to write that paper at two in the morning, nobody goes, mm, let me get them baby carrots, right? You know, most times it's like, well, I'm gonna eat these potato chips. I'm just gonna eat this ice cream straight out the carton, right? You know, it, it happens. So one of the first things we decided to do, and this is um, actually my collaborator, uh, Tamara Jeffries here, and this is yoga on the quad. So um, Bennett doesn't have homecoming, we do Ebony Soul. So Ebony Soul takes place in the spring, and the students actually requested this event. So they wanted us to come and do yoga first thing Saturday morning. What you can't see over here is a bunch of food trucks. <laughs> but you know, it's, it was, it's a good start, it was a good start. So you know, the food trucks were setting up for the afternoon, but they were gonna start the morning with yoga on the quad, and they got you know, their friends to come out and participate. So one of the things we want to do moving forward, yes, we still have this as a PE class, but we actually want to add more of the yoga principles into the class. So right now, the class is basically breathing and asana or postures. And oh, and also let me share that with you. Um, very little Sanskrit is used in class. Remember I told you that Bennett is United Methodist affiliate? Well, we found out, and that's another talk that I can give, how, how to implement yoga into, um, uh, a religious uh, institute, actually the cultural competency talk is one we do have to give a couple times, but um, no Sanskrit. It's almost like a foreign language. Um, talking about mudras, um, again, you kind of have to show where it also fits into Christianity, so it's okay to have these mudras with the meditation that you're trying to do. So what we're doing now is revamping the syllabus so we can fact, um, focus more so on this practice instead of just doing. So introducing them to the actual eight limbs of yoga, 
right? So not just talking about yamas and niyamas like she already does with, you know, a hips uh, and self-care, because, you know, it's like a little buzzword right now. They've been talking self-care and yoga, right? But having that implemented into the class. I also want to do this longitudinally because right now we're saying the yoga helps, right? I got a couple of mean differences and correlations that we can talk about, but I actually want to empirically test this. So I'm um, working on IRB right now that would actually bring in the other PE classes. So everybody gets the measures, but we will follow these students from fall semester to spring semester to see if in the spring they're still like implementing these different yoga practices and how it's impacting them. The other um, PE classes involved would be um, basketball and fit and condition. So one that's, you know, highly activity. The other one is more kind of weightlifting in the fit and condition class. I also do a comparison as to what's going on with um, the yoga as well. Um, the race-based traumatic stress injury also has a scale. So we can take an assessment of whether or not some of the issues that we're making the assumption that our students are experiencing, or that they really are, is taking place in there. And of course, revamping that syllabus. So already in the syllabus, she has a writing component. We try to sneak writing in every class any way that we can. <laughs> so they have a journal that they keep in the PE class. And that's actually where Professor Jeffrey started learning what was going on. Because she came to me one day and was like, we need to do something with these journal entries. And I was like, you can burn them because you don't have an IRB. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? So that's where the previous study came from, where I said, OK, well, let's actually you know, set this up as an experiment and, and, and see if they're still reporting out the same way. And we did. But moving forward, we are going to keep that component in there with the idea of saying that moving forward, um, there could be some type of yoga impact or effect. So of course, we're thinking that the universal context of racism is going to have a positive correlation with this race-based traumatic stress injury. Right? So if you have this monitoring system to saying these things are going to happen, you're probably also more likely to experience the injury because your body is saying, hey, I know that's why those people may have treated me this way. Or I may walk into this situation and these things may happen right? at um, any given time. And sometimes we do this and we don't even realize it. Or even, I think, as I was walking across campus just now from the Welcome Center, you know, I'm seeing some students. And a, um, a young black couple looked at me, and they nodded and smiled, and I nodded and smiled. And then I'm thinking, they already assuming I'm a professor? Because they know I must not be a student dressed like this. But did they just speak to me because I was black? So that's kind of like the same way how this is working. So it doesn't necessarily have to be negative. Now, that also just could have been Southern hospitality. I would probably bet 85% was because I was black. Right? But that's kind of how this works. So it's not necessarily negative with the monitoring that's taking place. Also, we're going to tender, um, continuously to see the same finding that we've already saw with centrality. But because of that ostracism finding, I'm thinking that my students, we call them bells, right, might be at a greater risk for this tra um, traumatic stress injury, just based on that 40.6 mean that's coming off of CESD. I mean, that, that's huge. That's something serious that we want to think about. I also feel like racial identity is going to actually um, intertwine with this idea of contemplative practices. Because saying that, you know, I'm, I'm black girl magic, right, and, uh, and all these other positive things that the students love to, to do, um, wake, pray, slay. That's a, that's a pretty big common one on our campus, right? They, they wake up, they pray, and then they slay all day, right? But it still comes back to this certain level of black identity would even make you have some type of slogan like that, a rhythmic right, slogan that's speaking to your existence, but also your faith in God and then how much you can accomplish in a day, right? which kind of comes back to that mindfulness and, and mental ideas and understanding. So ooh, went too fast. So just some things to think about. So remember I told you the premise of my research is success and satisfaction, right? So with success, there's a whole lot of other things that are going on that people don't always talk about. And what we have to realize is intergroup dynamics and bias is huge, right? When it comes to those intergroup inter dynamics, campus climate matters, right? There is no perfect college campus. Not even going to try to pretend like there is. What we have are students that have to find a fit for what works best for them. And then I might even just be what works best for them in that uh, amount of time. You know, anecdotally speaking, um, Myself, I'm from a very small town, went to a predominantly white high school. I couldn't wait to get to HBCU. I saw a different world. Mine was blown. Brother went to Fayetteville State. I went to homecoming. It's a wrap. 
But one of my close friends, we went to the same high school, we participated in the same marching band, she had the opposite, right? Well, for her, she was like, I'm going to NC State, right? I'm accustomed to dealing with these people. I don't know if I can work in that kind of environment. And that was that, right? Same upbringing, you know, same extracurriculars, everything was the same, but yet that school was a better fit for her, this school was a better fit for me. Because I think oftentimes we have these ideas as to how it works out, but it's a lot more complex than that, right? It's a lot more complex is going into play. Also, just thinking about the universal biases that our students may be encountering. So not just on campus, but when they leave campus, or technologically speaking nowadays, when they just turn on the computer. Right? Because you never know how these biases are going to start coming into play. And it doesn't necessarily have to be race-based. Right? I'm using that universal context of racism as an example, but for my students, a lot of times we have to talk about gender issues. Right? I literally just had a gender conversation with my student this morning. Please don't come and apologize to me for being late for class because you needed to curl your hair. Would you have told me that if I was a male professor? But I know you'll understand. No, I don't. Because you were still late for my class. Right? So these biases can speak to different things. And then just that, whole, that same take home message with the well-being, where I think a lot of times we're trying to um, say, oh, well, we need to do this here and that here, and, and this is probably going to work at this campus. All of these campuses are different. The only thing that the same is the students, right? Every campus has students. I think that we can all agree on. But how we handle those students on that particular campus, I think that needs more work. And that could um, potentially start with how are you defining success and satisfaction, right? Because that success and satisfaction definition is not necessarily always, at any given time, correlated with what the students think. So another thing I want to do moving forward outside of that longitudinal studies um, Focusing on yoga, because right now more of my efforts have been going there, because I need something that's going to kind of keep the morale going with the students. But why don't we just ask them, right? So sometimes in class I ask my students, right, what is, what is success? What is satisfaction? Because I, I think oftentimes we get up in our um, towers and silos and we start doing all of this data collection without that open-ended question to make sure we're actually assessing what it is that the students are thinking. Thank you.